Well, welcome to another Light Blade Learning Lab. Today is a, a fairly cool day outside. Um, you may notice that we've got some rather nice glowing red lights in here. Um, my temperature system down there tells me it's 8 degrees in here. At about 9 degrees I have my heating system coming on to make sure that this machine never gets anywhere near freezing point. We've been rather gloomy in the past few sessions about looking after yourself, looking after the machine, making sure that it's working well, all the things that might go wrong with the machine. Don't get me wrong, they're unlikely to, but if they do then it's best to be prepared. Today we're going to go into something slightly lighter. Now my background is engineering. I've always worked with metals, wood, glass, plastics, electrics, hydraulics. I accidentally stumbled upon cardboard engineering when I needed a project for my other machine over there to test and demonstrate ordering of cuts. Now we've already done some ordering of cuts but today we're going to go back into cardboard engineering and we're going to use ordering of cuts again in a, in a quite a big way. Um, cardboard engineering is absolutely a fascinating subject. It's a mix of engineering and artistic talent. Now I have to admit to having almost zero artistic talent. I might be a, a designer as such but being a designer and being an artist are poles apart. Today what we're going to do is create some cardboard vehicles for moving forward to learn about engraving, putting pictures onto various surfaces. Um, it's a springboard for the future. Now if you want lots and lots of projects, this is not the site to be on. We will be doing quite a few projects and we will be doing them in depth. If you want to rush ahead with some projects, you can go and look on various other websites, like you can go and look on the Trotec website, you can go and look on the Epilog website, you can go and look on um, Moira's Creative Room, which is a fantastic website for producing cards and all sorts of things. Um, there's Pinterest. There's, there's a whole world of craft and creativity out there on the interweb. Cardboard is not an expensive material. But if you find it is too expensive, then hey, there's lots of free cardboard around. You might want to engineer your projects initially in a, a cheap form of cardboard. And such a cheap form of cardboard is the inside surface of cereal packs. The cardboard used for cereal boxes is just about the right weight. So hey, it's a very cheap commodity to start cardboard engineering with. OK, that's enough chat. Let's get into RD Works and start doing something. We'll be back here shortly to do some cutting. OK, well here's our little first cardboard project. Uh, it's basically a little gift box. So this is nice and plain and simple at the moment, uh, but we will decorate it um, later on. But what we'll do first of all is we'll go and make sure that the box itself works. We can't get both of these out of the same piece of card so we should delete that. This whole project is designed around A4 size cards which you can easily buy. A quick look at this project tells us that we've got an outside shape, some holes and some perforations. Now all of those things are going to be cut and we shall be able to do that all with the same setting. So we can do that on one layer we can have a look at the cut parameters. I will show you how I go about actually finding the right speed um, when we get onto the machine. I'm going to guess at the moment and say that we could probably do this at around about, it depends on the thickness of the cardboard, it depends on the lens that I've got fitted to the machine and I know that I've got a one and a half inch lens which is quite a, a scalpel -y type lens, it's pretty good at piercing through things with a fine cut. So I think that we should probably have a speed of about maybe, let's start off at 15 millimetres a second because it, the card is a little bit thicker than I would normally use and we'll have a power. Now power is a funny thing because there's a strange phenomenon that occurs which you've heard me talk about before. It's a hissy characteristic that the beam has at low currents. The beam isn't properly formed and it goes into a high frequency high power cutting mode 
and I exploit that a great deal for card cutting. So we'll make it 1515 and at some future date I'll explain more about this high frequency impact engraving uh, mode that I'm using here. It's not something you can define, it's something you've got to find out for yourself with your particular tube. Okay, we're happy with that. Now all we've got to do is order the cuts. Well, if we take a look up here at the moment, I'm going to take you to this little edit cut property. If we click on there, we shall find we've got hundreds. What have we got? 105 elements that make up this drawing. Let's do cancel. And what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to click on the outside shape. So that's the outside shape. We check that the outside shape is red continuously all the way around, which it is. And we'll put that into a group. Now, we don't really need to put that into a group because it's just one item. But the reason we're putting it into a group is because we're going to do this next. We're going to mark the whole lot. Very simple. But then I'm going to hold down the shift key and I'm going to subtract the outside shape by clicking on it like that. So now we've got everything that we didn't mark in the first group and we're going to put that into another group which is the second group. Okay, let's now go and have a look at our cut properties. Right, so what we need to do is make sure that we do the uh, perforations first. So we mark the perforations by clicking on that group and that's element number two. We'll use the two arrows at the top there and transfer that element across to a new list. And then we've got this item here which we can transfer across to the list as well. So we know we've cut the perforations first and the outside shape second. OK. We're happy. Now, I'm using this offline computer at the moment still. So we've saved that to a U file. And now we'll backtrack, as I've shown you before, with Control Z. And we'll step back several steps until we get back to the original drawing. And now we can delete this item. And we can program these. Now, if these are made out of the same material, we've already got the cut settings up there. So we don't need to worry about that. But what we need to do is to sort out the order. Now again, we can see that we've got outside shapes and we've got inside shapes. Well, we want the inside shapes to cut first. So what we'll do, we'll click on the outside shape here, hold down the shift key and click that outside shape as well because that's nice and simple to do. So now we've collected two outside shapes and we'll put those into a group. And now all I've got to do is click on the whole lot, hold down the shift key and remove the first group. And there we go. So that's everything else now collected into a second group. And we're happy with that. So let's go and look at our cut properties. And we need the holes cut first, so let's check that. We'll put those across into a group and then we'll do the outside shape put that across into a group and we're done. So programming is as simple as that and we'll save that to a U file and we'll call that box 2. Okay let's go and cut those. Okay well here we are at the machine and as I promised you we're going to be using um, some, some scrap cardboard to do our prototype work with. Now we've got two types of cardboard here we've got some grey stuff and some white stuff. Now they feel about the same thickness but whether they're going to cut the same we can't really say. So to try and find out we're going to use the grey one to start with. It's not really very flat and flat is something that we need to be if we're going to be using a one and a half inch lens because the one and a half inch lens has only got focus range of around about a millimetre or a millimetre and a half. But before we do that we really ought to try and find out what the cutting parameters are and the quick way of doing that is to use a scrap piece of material and I'm going to load up onto the machine here 40 millimeter test square programmed into here but the parameters are wrong at the moment we're going to change the cutting speed to we said 15 let's take it up to 20 and see what happens and now we'll just set the height correct now I've got a couple of gauges here which are step gauges. One of them measures in half millimetres and the other one measures in millimetres. So this one, for instance, that step is five millimetres and on this one the step is 5.5. So 
I've got one which steps up in millimetres and another one which is half a millimetre bigger which gives me the increments in between. For the one and a half inch lens that I've got in here I need to have a 6.5 millimetre gap underneath it. And then we'll just select the ZU button and we'll take the take it down a shade and there we are, six and a half millimetres. It's as simple as that. Uh, we'll just do a frame just to test it and away we go. Now that's cut out nicely. Now it's got a black edge on it as you can see which means that we've got some burning taking place as well as cutting. So we can still go faster. Yes. So does that mean to say we can go to 55? Let's try 55. That's a hell of a lot different than we started with. Wow. <laughs> now, let's just try the test again. Now we're getting virtually no mark off the edge. So this is the real test. When you get a nice clean cut, you know that you've nearly reached the maximum speed that you can. Uh, we'll try 65, but I think 65 is going to fail on the basis of what I've just seen. Sixty-five still drops out, and we've got a very nice edge on it. It's hardly burnt at all. Now you can't see that, but what I will do is I will put it onto a piece of white card so that we can see what happens. Look at that, virtually no marking at all, just the merest hint. One mark and then the edge goes clean. So. Even at 65, we're still not at the limit. Let's try 75. And now it doesn't drop out. It does, just about, but it didn't drop out. So I think we've reached more or less the limit. But let's just check what the edge condition is. Virtually clean. So, what do we do? Do we run the risk of running at 75 or do we stay safe and go to 65? Well, I don't think there's any real question here, is it? We'll drop it back to 65, knowing that it's going to work perfectly well. So they're the settings that we're ideally looking for now. 15%, 15% and 65 millimetres a second. <clears throat> now that's the first thing that we need to do. And this, this procedure that I've got here, of gradually increasing the speed, checking the edge finish, uh, until it doesn't drop out um, is the standard procedure for trying to find the best cutting speed that you can. Now, I've got another variable here, which is the air. Now, if I turn the air down, it would change these settings. At the moment, because I'm cutting cardboard or wood or any other organic material, you need the most air that you can possibly get. If this was acrylic, then the rules would be different. But I need maximum airflow at the moment for this particular arrangement. We'll go on to doing the same sort of tests for checking other materials in another session. But I thought I would just show you that procedure to start with. I'm using this bed at the moment because this is only a prototype. I would normally cut card on a pin bed. And we will set the pin bed up to do the job for real towards the end of this video. But that may well cause us another problem, uh, which we'll deal with as we approach it. So later on, when we come to do the real box, we'll set up the pin bed. But we're just trying to do a quick prototype at the moment, and it doesn't ma matter if we get marks on the back of the box anyway. We'll set the origin there, we'll check the frame, That works, so we'll go for it. Now you can hear that hissy noise. At some stage you may hear the noise go quiet. 
when it's doing the outside. Oh, that last little bit went quiet. Now, hopefully, if we've got this right, it's just on the verge of breaking through or not. And that's because of the other possible problem that we, we may well have encountered with this machine. Well, we struggled to get this card out over this corner here, which probably means that there's something a bit adrift with the flatness of the table over this corner. The table might not be level, because remember I told you that this, this particular lens is very sensitive to height. Let's put some folds in here, and then we'll put some pre-bends in here like this and like that and then across the bottom we need to fold the bottoms up like that at 90 degrees we've got to glue those edges together let's go and do that with some double-sided tape well here we've got some very strong um, double-sided tape it's industrial quality called VHB tape and as you can see it's made by a company called Tessa or teaser, that edge there. We'll cut the excess off and then we need a small piece on here. Right, well there's our double-sided tape attached there now. Let's just peel the backing off a little bit and we'll put a tab on it like that. We'll fold it across at 45 degrees and put a tab on it. We'll take this one off. I've put the tab the wrong way so let's fold the tab out the other way like that because what I want to do is fold the whole thing flat and lay it together there like that where it's not sticking make sure everything is lined up and then we'll go to the other end where the glue is and we can press that down now we know that everything's lined up and what we can do is we can pull this out and everything's nicely stuck together. Now the first thing that we've got to do is a bit of a tricky job because we've got to get these four overlapping. We'll get this get this little rosette shape on the top there and then we should be able to push the whole lot together like that. Right. Now that's the ideal situation that you want but the neatest solution would be to have all of that inside. Push all these four pieces inwards like that <clears throat> and you can see how we've got like an internal rosette there okay they're all nicely lined up with each other okay so now we've got our little rosette down the inside there what we need to do is get something round and flat on the end and here we've got a pen with a nice big top on it and I may well block the view for you but I'm trying to put pressure in the center there and push it down and there we go now I've pressed it down when we look at the bottom the bottom is nice and neat so that's the first part done and now what we've got to do we've got to go around these parts and we've got to fold these inwards like this and ultimately where we're going to finish up is doing this but several things I notice um, First of all, these pieces haven't come out here. So again, we think we've got the speed right, but we haven't got the focus right. So I think we ought to go back and take a look at the focus issue before we do the real thing. We're now gonna remove the honeycomb bed. And what's underneath is this bar table. So what I like to do is to use this as a base for an alternative table. And this is something that I have made and it's nothing more than a piece of folded steel. The great advantage of this is it produces an even flat surface for me to put my pin bed on. But before I put the pin bed on, what I'm going to do is to check the flatness of this surface.
And there we go, look I've made that so that's just a snug fit under 15 millimeters and it doesn't go up onto the 16. 14.5. Still got something like about 0.2 under there, 14.5 with a 0.2 gap makes it about 14.7. 15 is what we were looking for and would you believe it, 15 is what we've got. I'd say that's probably about 14.3. So that's what our table looks like. Now when we were doing this, you might remember that I pointed out that this corner over here was a problem corner, and sure enough, it is a problem corner. Not terribly so. I mean, I had about four or five millimeter offset on my Chinese machine when I checked the table, so this one is pretty near perfect, but not quite. So, what we're going to do, we've got some material here which is 0.7 of a millimetre thick. And I've got some cardboard here which is 0.3 of a millimetre thick. Now those are perfect dimensions for me to make a wash up with. It's the great advantage of having a laser, you can do your own fixes. One wash up. Two washers, 0.7, and one washer, 0.3. How about that? Okay, well hopefully we've now fixed the problem. So here's the back corner, and I've set that to 15, and that is, you can hear from the way the air is stopping, I've just about got that correct at 15. And then we have the front corner here. I would say that's within probably about 0.1 or 0.2 of a millimetre, being correct. And at this front corner here, I'd say that's probably within 0.1 in the back corner. And I would say that that's spot on. So we've basically got 15, 15, minus 0.2, minus 0.1. So I don't think we're really going to worry too much about that. That's near enough, as perfect as we can get a table. Well, the one thing we didn't do was to check the middle, of course. 15, spot on. Now, the reason I need the table set so perfectly is because I'm going to be using these. But this is my pin table, which I always use for cutting card. I much prefer to have the card sitting up in the air so that any of the debris falls right the way through. And if you look carefully on this surface here, you'll see that it is slightly pockmarked. And that's because the excess energy that passes through the card gets absorbed into this surface here and does not reflect up and produce any burn marks on the back of the card. So here we've got some dowel pins. Yeah, they're 33 millimeters long. And I'll sit those around the edge to support the card. That's pretty good. There's a slight tendency for the pins to move just a little bit in the holes, because no matter how good you get the holes, they've got to be absolutely perfect to stop the pins from moving. So we don't really want the card to be moving around in space. So what we do, so I've got a couple of little packing pieces there. And I have a steel block which sits on top of those packing pieces. Now we pop our card on top there. Now the middle at the moment is unsupported. Now because this is not a really complicated job, what we'll do, we'll just put two or three pins in the middle there just to support the middle. Now just put the edge of that card on the steel block and hold it in place with a couple of magnets. And there we go. So the card is now absolutely solid in space. We'll just set the depth to 6.5. We'll put some air on.
hear how that beam has gone quiet now. This time we should find that it just drops out. So there's our part one. I'll now put part two in as well. And part two, which basically is the bow for the box, will make it out of a pretty pink. Oh, I'm not running this at the right speed. This is running at a very slow speed. Right, we'll now turn this into a little work surface with a piece of plywood. You've seen how the first part works. We need to fold the, this is the outside here, which is the hammer finish side. So we'll put some folds in there to start with. We need to pre-crease these. Just to put the bends in them. Now we'll fold down the bottoms. But before we do any more, we've got to glue those two pieces together with some tape. So I'll put a fold on that and remove the other piece of backing tape completely. Check everything's lined up. Hold that there because it's not sticking. And then the bit here which is sticky, we'll push it down. And then we'll pull this piece of tape out and stick the rest. Now what we've got to do is to tuck these pieces in, if you remember, and then we've got to try and get them arranged so that they, they make that internal rosette. So I hope you can see that they're nice and symmetrically arranged into that nice little rosette. And now all we've got to do is to go inside and push the centre down. And there we go. It's a beautiful job. Push these corners in and the whole thing folds in and jumps out, folds in, jumps out, like that. Okay, so that's the box assembled. Now all we've got to do is these little pieces here. Now, these are dead easy because all we've got to do is fold them in half. There's a crease line across the middle. Before you put them together, while, you, while you're holding it with your fingers, just spread them out a bit like that, so that they're separated. And then we do the same to the other one. If we look at these, you'll see that they're not quite the same. One has got a slot in the top, and the other one has got a slot in the bottom. Now the one that's got the slot in the top needs to go on first. And what we're going to do, we're going to close the whole box up, and we're going to clip that, it should go into that slot like that, and this one should go into this slot, and then you should be able to do the same with this one, because this one will now drop over the top. It'll drop through there like that. And then we should be able to put that one in that slot and this one in this slot. And there we have a little presentation box. Well, now we've made our little presentation box, um, I had planned to try and get it decorated and do a bit more with it today. But sadly, I think we're running out of time. And I think we shall have to put this into a, a part two, which is good in a way because we should be able to squeeze a lot more into part two. Why did I run out of time in part one? I think because I'm a bit of a finicky so-and-so. It wasn't absolutely essential to set that table flat. And I have to just say that because there was no fault on the part of Think Laser that that table wasn't perfect. It was not bad at all because the lenses that are supplied usually are a two inch lens, a two and a half inch lens, and a four inch lens. Now, I'm using a one and a half inch lens which has got a particularly fussy uh, depth sensitivity. And I had to make sure that that table was set spot on to do the job. As you've seen, it didn't work quite in one corner because of slight variation in depth. Now, it does demonstrate the sensitivity of a one and a half inch lens, but a one and a half inch lens is a fantastic lens for cutting card. You could do the same thing with a two inch lens, and had I been using the two inch lens, the table variation would have not mattered one little bit at all. No blame or anything on Think Laser or the Chinese company that put this together. Um, it's just me being ultra fussy. So thanks for your time today. You need to think about the loved one that you're going to give a gift to because we're going to put some sort of presentation logo on this next time. Goodbye for now.